and social media. We're so happy you're here with us today and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, indeed. It is so happy to see you all here this morning. Thank you for those who are joining us online. Your presence means a lot to us. Uh, friends, my name is Pastor Marquise Hobbs. I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at the church. Um, and there are just a couple of announcements that I want to draw your attention to. Uh, but one of the first one is many of you have heard how my aunt is the one that raised me. You all have met her before, etc. This weekend is her birthday. And to celebrate, some of my family from Dallas have come in town. And so they're worshiping over to my right, your left. Um, they are here as well as the other family. My cousin Yvonne, we, we call her Cutting Yvonne, right? We just cut it short. Cutting Yvonne is turning 95. Is that right? 91. All right. So Cutting Yvonne is turning 91, made her way down from Dallas to celebrate. And so this is an awesome day for myself and my family. Uh, for those who are visitors here among us, this is what we do. We are a family together in Christ. And so if you could please register your attendance with us, that allows us to know, hey, we got some family members in the house and some who are maybe on their way to being a family. You can register your attendance by scanning the QR code in the bulletin or checking out the uh, connect card there in the back. You simply fill it out, tear it off, and put it in the offering basket. Uh, so many of you all know this is the final week for our small group campaign. This is the final week to sign up, the final Sunday. Uh, that will be happening for six weeks. There are lots of things that are happening. I won't mention them to you all. Uh, they can be found on our website in the bulletin. But at this time, let's stand up. Let's shake a hand. Let's greet somebody. It's been a while since you've seen them. Tell them your cologne smells good. I like them highlights, girl. That's a nice fade. Where'd you buy that polo shirt? so glad you're here. Let's sing together. Let's praise God. Thank him for all he's done. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. Sing, I try. I try with all my might. But I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. I'm a vagabond. Just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. All right, here we go. You pick me up. You turn me around. You place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior. Because you heal my heart, you change my name. Forever free, I'm not the same. I thank the master, I thank the savior. I thank God. All right, I cannot deny. I cannot deny what I've seen. I have no choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind. So, so long to my old friends, burden and bitterness, you can keep it moving. Now you ain't welcome here. That's right. <laughs> From now. From now till I walk the streets of gold. I sing of how you saved my soul. This wayward son has found his way back. Oh, you pick me up, 
He turned me around. He placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. Because you heal my heart. You change my name. Forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master. I thank the Savior. Come on. All right, sing this with me, church. Yeah. Hell is lost. Hell lost another one. I, I am free. Yeah. I am free. Oh, I, I am free. free. Proclaim it. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. I am free. Yes, God. Hell lost another one. Place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you heal my heart. You change my name forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior. I thank God. Let's go, Amen. Continue to sing praise and give him thanks this morning as our firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Oh, he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. And I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense, so I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength, cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So why? in this bridge together church not that rains won't come but that when they do our house will be built on Jesus so we're safe Let's sing and believe rain came wind blew but my house 
house was built on you. I'm safe with you. I'm gonna make it through. Sing that, church believers. God some praise this morning, church. Thank him for what he's done, what he's doing. So God, we do just that this morning. We give you thanks, Jesus. We give you thanks for so many reasons, God, for so many blessings that you've given us. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. Your steadfastness that lasts from generation to generation, God. That as we sing, no matter what this world throws at us, no matter the size of the storm or the size of the mountain in front of us, God, you remain faithful and true and bigger than all those things. You never said this life would be easy, God. So God, when we want easy, would you remind us that while things may not be easy, you are with us, Jesus. That we will, in fact, we will have trouble in this world, God. You said so yourself. Remind us, you also said to take heart. For you have overcome. You've overcome this world and everything that comes with it, Jesus. illness and sorrow, darkness and evil, broken things in our life, God, you are greater than it all. We thank you for those truths this morning. God, and we just press into you now. Even if just for the rest of this hour, God, we press into you. But I pray that you would speak to us in a way this morning, God, that it would would inspire us to do that more than just for this hour, God. Let us live a life that points to you. Be a people that lean on you, God. A people that stand firm. We pray to you in your name only this morning. Amen. Let's sing that last verse again, church. Christ is my firm foundation, rock, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. 
I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. Sing, he won't. He won't. Amen. Praise God. Our home group is fun. We have fun and we love to eat. So the first thing we always do is have dinner and we share what's going on and then we have our Bible study and then we have our prayer time. Every group's going to be a little different. Every, every group has mm -hmm. individual personalities. We have lots of laughter and fun and there's, there's a spirit of joy. We also um, have a meal before and that's sort of our catch up time and see checking in with everyone and see how everyone is doing and that um, again is just how we started and then we go into the study. We're made up of couples and singles. We've designated one night a week and about an hour and a half for our get together. Someone brings a snack. Uh, we spend the first few minutes uh, just visiting and catching up with each other and then we start our study and then the last few minutes have been reserved for uh, prayer concerns and any joys that anyone wants to share. We have a half hour social time to catch up and see what everybody's doing and we generally have um, a dessert <laughs> during that time. Someone on the fringes who is thinking about joining a home group, you may not know how much you need a home group because you haven't experienced it. If you're thinking about it, do it. That's all I could say is just jump in and do it and come and visit our home group. We'd love to have you and um, we'd love to welcome you into our family. Give it a shot. Just do it. <laughs> it's not going to be a bad experience. Yeah, it's not a bad experience. Yeah. It could be the best experience of your life. It might be just an okay experience, but it's not going to be a bad experience. So just give it a shot. Just commit to give it a to give it a try, give it a chance, and then see how you feel. See if you feel like you're growing in your faith. Um, see if you are feeling like there's a connection forming between your group. And I, I think you'll find that that there is. Try it. If you you're looking for connection, and love and support. A small group's a great way to do it. And boy, how do y'all keep making these mission moments so easy? Can I just say that? Because there is so much to celebrate in the life of the church. God is good, and God is good through you. I want to lift up something to celebrate, and it's about small groups. You've heard the pitch, but let's celebrate something. 70, 70, 70 new people have signed up for new small groups starting this fall. Yeah, this week. That is huge. That's most of this group in this room, right? 70 people. So you've heard the pitch. Just do it. Just do it because we need community. I am in a small group on Tuesday nights and, you know, through all of the ups and downs of life, it is so, so good to share that with somebody else. This week, our daughter Leah starts day school and you know that I'm going to be sharing my tears and my excitement and all of those feelings and all of those thoughts that are coming up. But I have a group. I have a group of people that I can lean on and be supported through that and support each other. You don't want to miss out. You don't want to miss out. You want to be a part of this. So I'm going to ask you, if you have your bulletin in your hands, would you go ahead and tear that out? Pastor Marquise talked about it already. This is how you register your attendance, but it's also how you get involved, how you get plugged in, how you can share the gifts that God has given you with the church and with the world, with this community of your time, of your money. Fill that out and drop it in the basket as we go into this offering time. But I'm going to invite us to join in together in a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? 
Holy, holy God, you are a God of community. Lord, as author said, an author said that community happens when we go off topic together. Lord, in these small groups, in these home groups, we get to share what's going on in our lives. We get to lift each other up. And that is a sharing of our gifts, our gifts of presence with each other. Lord, we give you thanks for these opportunities that are happening in the life of this church right now to get plugged into your kingdom, to what you're doing in the lives of our families, in the lives of this church family. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for letting us pour ourselves into this opportunity where you will pour yourself into us. God, through the winds, through the storms, we need reminders that our faith comes from you, our life comes from you. It is a gift, and it is so hard to remember when those storms come and the wind blows. So God, I ask for your blessing, for your blessing over this, your people, that you would give us a community, a church family, to meet around tables and break bread and remember who you are, who you have called us to be. Lord, one of those songs, I thank God, said that you changed our name. Lord, when we become a part of your family, you call us what you call Jesus. You call us a beloved child. Lord, each one of us has a new name in this space when we choose you, beloved. God, bring us together to share that name around a table and to grow in that identity to grow in that identity as beloved children of God. Lord, thank you for our gifts. Bind them up, wrap them up together, and use them to do your good work for your world through this people. All of this we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the mighty Holy Spirit. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire i just want to speak the name of jesus over fear and all anxiety To every soul held captive by depression I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name Break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is light. Break every stronghold. The shadows burn like fire. Shout.
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Come on, sing Jesus, church. Come on. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name So we follow a, a chart up here most of the time, a chord chart of some sort. But uh, we don't always follow that chart. Some of you may know that, some of you may not. There's also this guy that talks in our ears, little robot who tells us where to go. We don't always follow him either. And right now, I just feel like we need to sing that bridge again together this morning. It wasn't part of the plan, but sometimes you just need to sing Jesus, amen? From the mountains, yes. from the valleys, yes. from right here inside Christ Church at 3300 Austin Parkway. We'll sing Jesus together over our families, over our friends, over addiction, over depression, over cancer. Amen. We'll sing the name of Jesus. We believe there's power in his name, church. We'll sing this together. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Whatever you need this morning, church, sing Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Say it. Jesus. And shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Whoa. Over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Amen. God, we thank you this morning. God, we thank you for what you do in this place and what you do when we leave this place, God. God, we pray for chains to be broken, for dead things to come to life, for disease and illnesses to be eradicated, God. Oh, yes. That when doctors tell us no, God, you step in and you say yes.
God, and we believe that the same God that celebrates on the mountaintops also stands with us in the valleys. So if we're in one of those valleys right now, God, would you remind us that you're there, God? When it's hard to see past the darkness that surrounds us, God, remind us that you give light. You are love. You bring hope to that darkness, God. So be present in this place as we continue to worship this morning. Be present in our lives and in our hearts. In this one's name we pray. Amen. This is my fancy tablet holder. I believe that this was written in the book of Exodus when they were talking about lampstands and light poles. Uh, well, friends, last week I shared a joke with you all about the Aggie and the Longhorn, if you all remember that. For those of you who weren't in the room, I'll make it short. There were two sisters. One went to uh, A&M and the other went to UT. Well, one of the, the sisters had to move their cattle to another city. This was during a time where uh, telegrams were used. And so the sister who went to A&M had already left and the UT sister had to then send a telegram. She didn't have enough money, so she could only choose one word. The word she chose, as you heard the joke, was comfortable. The telegram, right? The telegrapher was saying, are you sure she will understand this? The UT student said, of course she will, because Aggies read slow. She'll read, come for the bull, right? And so some of you who have not heard that before are now caught up to speed. Great. So I have another joke. Going to see how well this goes, okay? This is for all of you Aggie fans, right? Because that wasn't very Aggie friendly. When four Longhorns are in a car, who's the driver? The police. No, I'm just kidding, right? <laughs> Great, I'm glad that that went over well, okay? So now you can say that joke for both the Aggies and the Longhorns with one happy family. Uh, speaking of family, this begins our new sermon series today. It is called Family Matters, The Life of Joseph. For the last three weeks, we have been campaigning for small groups. We said, find a group, sign up. There are so many. And as you heard me talk about earlier, many of you answered that call to say, I want more community. I want to find a place to belong and to grow my faith. And so we've had more than 70 of you all join up to be in a small group, and there's still time. Over the next six weeks, we'll be in this study really talking, really focusing on the life of Joseph and his family, particularly about his family's dysfunction. Now, let me tell you this. Every family is dysfunctional. Now, some of us may be on a sliding scale of dysfunction, right? But every family is dysfunctional. If you do not think your family is dysfunctional, that might mean you are the dysfunctional one. Amen. Right. And so over the next series, we're going to begin to study the life of Joseph, go a little bit deeper, figure out these family patterns that are repeated, how Joseph breaks these cycles, et cetera, et cetera. Today, what I want to do is I want to set up the story of Joseph. There's a lot to cover, but I won't make you read it all. That's called Bible study at home, right? But what I do want to do is to show you how dysfunctional Joseph's family is how his father is repeating a pattern of dysfunctionality and also bring us into the story to say, what about the dysfunction in our family? And are you and I repeating and continuing that dysfunction into the next generation? Will you join me in prayer? Lord, we're so grateful for what you're doing here in our midst. We thank you for our worship leader and good friend, GT, just setting the stage on fire, Lord. And we are grateful for the amazing band that he leads and that leads us. Lord, as we come forth in this place, I ask that you would prevent me from being an obstacle to the gospel so that you would bring forth a word that comforts the afflicted, afflicts the comfortable, and meet us all in the in-between. In your son's name we pray. Amen. To know a person, you have to know where they come from. It would be different to you all if I said I was raised in River Oaks and went to school in River Oaks versus I was raised in a place called Dieball. It's a little bit of a difference, right? It would be different if I told you that I came from a two-parent household versus a household with a single parent. 
the way that we are brought up in our family history impacts who we are and says a little bit about us. So to know about Joseph's story, we have to first understand who his family is. And it begins with a man named Jacob. His name is literally translated trickster or little cheat. Imagine you were born and your parents literally call you little cheat on your birthday. <laughs> right? And the reason being is because he was born a twin to his brother Esau. And when Esau came out the womb, Jacob was there holding on to his ankle, right? And so they called him Little Cheat, Trickster. That was his name. It wasn't a nickname, all right? And so what happened is, as the story will tell us from Genesis, he lived up to that name. He tricked his brother Esau out of a birthright because Esau was the firstborn. But he tricked Esau into giving him that birthright. Then Jacob tricked his father into blessing him with the firstborn, firstborn blessing. The blessing that should have went to Esau, Jacob tricked his father with the help of his mama. That ought to tell you something, right? Mama getting messy in the situation. Now baby go on in there and tell your daddy da da da, right? And so now with the mom's help, Jacob manipulates, Jacob tricks his father into blessing him instead of Esau. And you can only imagine how Esau responds. He has no birthright. There's no more blessing. So he gets mad and angry. And at this point, Jacob flees from his home. And this is where we'll kind of pick up more of his story. When he leaves his house, he goes to his uncle's house, his mom's brother. When he gets there, he sees this beautiful young lady. Scripture says that she had a wonderful frame. I'll let you think about what that means, right? She was easy on the eyes. But on a play of words, Rachel also had another sister who was her older sister named Leah. Lisa, Leah, scripture says, had a tender eye. Some of you are starting to question, what was a tender eye? It doesn't mean she kind of looks tenderly. No, it means that there's a little weakness in one of the eyes. And so one of them might have been lazy one of them might have been going in a circle. One of them might have been looking to the side. She had a lazy eye. That was the older sister named Leah. Rachel was the more beautiful one. And so Jacob came to his uncle and said, hey, unk, listen, that young lady out there, I want to marry her. Let me work for you. The uncle said, sure, give me seven years. Jacob said, fine. He worked seven years, seven long years. Some of us can't stay at a job two years before we want to quit, right? Jacob stays there for seven years, and after seven years, they throw a whole festival feast for him. I'm talking about buffet, open bar, margarita, and Tito's for everybody. Get in a party lit. It's fun, right? So then when Jacob goes to his bedchambers to consummate the marriage, his uncle actually tricks him. His uncle doesn't give him Rachel who he wants. He gives him Leah. And so here's what Jacob says when he wakes up in the morning. He said, in the morning, Jacob discovered it was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what in the world have you done to me? Didn't I work for you in exchange for Rachel? Why have you tricked me? It is not our custom here, his uncle said, to give the younger daughter in marriage before the firstborn. Complete my older daughter's bridal week. Then we will give you the younger one in exchange for seven more years of work. Can y'all imagine that? You work seven years to get something, and you're given something else and then asked to work another seven years. And so this is exactly what Jacob does. He works another seven years to acquire Rachel as a wife. And the whole time, Leah is still in the picture. I want you to just think about that for a moment. Leah, the firstborn, her father had to trick another man to marry her. And then for seven years, this woman had to watch her husband work hard and tirelessly so that he can marry her sister. Can you just imagine the kind of pain and emotional trauma that does to Leah? to have to know that she was never enough for her husband, to know that she wasn't his favorite, to know that he was, she wasn't his first choice and that he's out there working for another woman. 
That's like if, ladies, you know your husband today is cheating on you with another woman and out there in the streets working to have an affair. Nobody is happy with that. And so eventually after seven years go by, Jacob acquires Rachel as a wife. And Scripture begins to tell us that during this time that he is married to her for these seven years, Leah starts to have children. Leah has the firstborn son given to Jacob named Reuben. And this is what she says after the firstborn. The Lord has looked with pity on my oppressed condition. Surely my husband will love me now. Surely my husband will love me now. She didn't feel loved by her husband. She didn't feel honored by her husband. So she thought a child could change that. When it didn't, she had a second son. And after the second son, she says, because the Lord heard that I was unloved, he gave me this one too. The third son, she says, now this time my husband will show me affection because I've given birth to three sons for him. I've given you three boys. Your legacy can continue. Surely you will love me now. Surely you will honor me now. Surely I ought to mean something to you instead of that girl, Rachel. And Jacob never loved her. So she had a fourth son. And this time she says, I will praise the Lord. Y'all, this woman had four kids hoping that her husband would love her, but he always loved the other one. And the dysfunction grows even more. Because now at this point, Leah has given him four sons. Rachel says, I'm barren. My sister is winning over me. My sister is giving children. I can't give him anything. She says to Jacob, surely have a child with me or else I would die. Jacob says, baby, I'm not God. I can't do that. And so in response, Rachel says, I'll give you my maidservant. What started off as one wife with Leah, he now marries Rachel, the second wife. And now Rachel's maidservant becomes his wife as well. And she gives birth to two children. And Rachel says this in response, I have fought a desperate struggle with my sister, but today I have won. How unhealthy does a family have to be when you start pitting children against each other? How unhealthy does a family have to be when you start comparing your kids to others and you say, now that my child is born, I'm going to be the one who wins. How unhealthy and dysfunctional do you have to be for that to be the case? But the story continues. Reuben, the firstborn, discovers some mandrakes. These are like plants that have healing poppers and properties. Rachel wants those. And so she says, Reuben, can you give them to me? Leah says, wait a minute. You want my son's mandrakes. Wasn't it enough that you've taken away my husband? Now you want to take away my son's mandrakes too? Rachel says, all right. He may go to bed with you tonight in exchange for your son's mandrakes. Leah then gives birth to three more children. Up until this point, there's been a wife, Leah. There's been the wife, Rachel. There's been a wife's maidservant. I didn't mention it, but, oh, Leah gave her maidservant too. So now Jacob has four wives, and three of them have all had children. At this point, he has 11 children by three different women. And you talk about baby mama drama and family dysfunction. But then, after that 11th child is born, which is a girl, Rachel finally gives birth to a beautiful baby boy named Joseph. Joseph is one of the last in the line of all his siblings, and his mom was the favorite, but his mom was the last one to give birth. And from this point, eventually Jacob would make his way back to his father's house. And, oh, on the way he had to to, um, trick his uncle, little cheat, right? If you read the story, he took some of his uncle's unblemished uh, flock 
He said, I'm going to take the strongest ones. I'm going to make them mate. They're going to be mine, and I'll give you the weak ones. And now he cheated his uncle out of having prosperity, and so he takes that with him back to his house. And on the way back to his house, he also loses Rachel because she gives birth to a second son named Benjamin. And then Scripture says, Jacob loved Joseph more than he did any of his other sons because Joseph was born when Jacob was very old. Jacob had even given Joseph that fancy coat of many colors, which showed that Joseph was his favorite son. And so Joseph's brothers hated him and would not be friendly to him. I imagine why. Dr. Elliot, who's writing the book we're reading, says, what kind of family system can you construct out of polygamy, bitter jealousy, rivalry, favoritism, manipulation, unloved wives, oh, and uncherished kids, all compounded by racial, ethnic, and religious diversity? Dr. Elliot says, I'll tell you what kind you get. One that plots to kill one of their brothers and ends up selling him as a slave. Genesis 37 is the poison fruit of the preceding 12 chapters. And this is the story of Joseph. But here's the question this morning. What about your story? This is Joseph's family, but what about your family? All of us have some dysfunctions inside of our family. If not, again, that means you're the dysfunctional one. That's why we have a mirror on the altar. Because when you come to God, you need to see yourself plainly and clearly. All of us have dysfunction. So maybe your dysfunction isn't like Joseph. Maybe, maybe you didn't have all of the civil rivalry that you had, but maybe your father wanted a son instead of a daughter. And he began to treat you like that. Maybe your mom and your dad didn't quite work out and your mom divorced your father because of an affair or because of abuse. And now every time she looks at you, you remind her of, her fa of your father and she can't love you the way you want it to be loved. Maybe the dysfunction inside of your household is because you've allowed abuse to continue on, but your family has kept it quiet. And so now you're having to wrestle and to deal with it. Maybe some of the things that you're dealing with is that your family hasn't taught you how to deal with conflict resolution. So now every time tension happens, you don't know anything but to run and avoid it. What is the family dysfunction that is in your story? Because we all have it. And here's something that's crazy. I hope you all walk away and get this. Not just that you have a dysfunctional family. We all do. But oftentimes the dysfunction in our family is just a repeated pattern we inherited from our forefathers. So if you look above you, I wonder if you see some of those same patterns in your father and your mother, in your grandmother and grandfather, in your aunts and uncles. Maybe it's the case that your father constantly had affairs and now you don't know how to stay in a covenantal relationship. Maybe it's the case that your, your family never knew how to hold a job because they're always trying to do something new, and now you're finding it hard to hold a job yourself. Maybe your family didn't have really a good history of loving their children, and now you're finding it hard to love your own. But when you look at your family structure, you begin to see a pattern that's created, and the same is the case for Joseph. Let me share this with you. See, Joseph's family was actually full of tricksters and little cheats. We all know Abraham who had many sons, right? We all know the covenant that God gave to him and said, you are going to be a blessing to the nations. But Abraham was a little cheating trickster too. If you read your Bible, you'll know that he married Sarah. And Sarah, when they were in Egypt, had told the people that we are brothers and sisters. And so Pharaoh's men was going to actually sleep with Sarah, but found out she was married. And now Pharaoh had to call him to the front and said, you almost caused me to sin because you tricked me. Then again, you had Isaac and Rebekah. They did the same thing that Abraham and Sarah did amongst the Philistines, said, I am brother and sister. And the Philistines said, you almost tricked me into having an affair with your wife and brought calamity on me. Laban tricked Jacob when he was with them. Jacob's mama helped him trick his father. Jacob tricked his brother. There is trickery repeated constantly throughout his family because a dysfunctional pattern is being repeated. 
that ain't the only one. Let me tell you about how it was full of civilry rivalry. Isaac and Ishmael, they could not see eye to eye. You had Jacob and Esau, they couldn't see eye to eye. Rachel and Leah, they couldn't see eye to eye. Now you got Joseph and his siblings trying to kill them. Dysfunctional patterns are constantly being repeated in the story of Joseph. It was even full of favoritism. Isaac and Rebekah favored Jacob over Esau. Jacob favored Leah. Jacob favored Rachel over Leah and their two servants. And now Jacob favored Joseph. And because Jacob favored Joseph, now the kids hated him and couldn't be kind to him. Let me tell you something. Again, I really hope that y'all get this. And I hope that this brings revelation to whoever hears it in this room today. Because it brought revelation to me. I heard a preacher one time. He said, Satan in Scripture is always referred to as a snake. Always referred to as a snake in the serpent. So then he asked himself, what are the different kind of snakes and serpents? Maybe there's something I need to understand. He made the conclusion, there are venomous snakes and there are non-venomous snakes. It's a big difference if you get bit by a rattlesnake and a grass snake. So then he looked a little bit deeper. He said, when we think about the sin in our lives, sometimes Satan will cause us to sin or we will give in to sin that's just like a non-venomous snake. Once it happens, it's done. There's nothing else to it. You learn from it. It makes you uncomfortable. And you know, don't go back in that situation or environment. But sometimes the venom seeps into our bloodline. And now the sin that happened to our father is being passed down to us because our father and our mother couldn't deal with it. Sometimes sin is so poisonous that it's inside of our blood and it's being passed down from generation and generation and generation and generation and generation because of this function started with an ancestor. They didn't address it. Their children didn't address it. Their children's children didn't address it. And now here we are dealing with the mess of somebody else because it's in our blood. Y'all going to make me preach this morning. See, what you need to understand is that this function is a pattern that will continue to repeat itself until you break it. This function will be a pattern that happens until you decide enough is enough. I won't live this life anymore because I see the end that it produces. I see the results that come from this. I see the brokenness that happens. I see the dishonesty that happens. I see the toxicity that happens. And I no more want to live according to this pattern that's been predicating and poisoning my family. So what is your story? What is the dysfunction in your family? Can you see the pattern that's repeated constantly? Because once you become aware of it, then you can address it, and then you can deal with it. Because here's the thing. As Christians, we believe that we are flesh inhabited by the Spirit. So though the flesh will continue to want to do what the flesh does and repeats itself, when we become aware of what the flesh wants, we can call on the spirit to break the cycle. That's why it was so important for us to call on the name of Jesus, because if you want to break cycles inside of your family, you need the blood of Jesus over your family. If you want to break the dysfunctional patterns, you need God to show up and to show out because you can't do it by yourself. So the dysfunction inside of your family needs the covering of the blood of Jesus. That's the only way we're going to break these cycles. That's the only way the lies stop, the affairs stop, the jealousy stops, the brokenness stops. All of this stops because we bring it to the cross of Jesus Christ who took it all on himself. This series, we're going to be studying the dysfunctional aspects of Joseph's family and his life. But Joseph was a cycle breaker, a pattern destroyer because of his relationship with God. My prayer for us today is that you don't let the same cycles get repeated, that you don't start new cycles, but instead you become aware of them playing in your family and you say as enough is enough. By God's grace through me, I will be the one that changes my family forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
as the band is making their way up this morning. Maybe you feel like a Aaliyah. Maybe you feel like that family member that is abused, neglected, and is invisible. Maybe you feel like a Reuben, a son who never really was loved like the other children and was compared. Maybe you are somebody in the story of Joseph, and today you're saying, Pastor, I want to break this cycle, and I need the help of Jesus Christ to do it. I want to pray over you, and then I'm going to give us some instructions on how you can receive prayer and begin to move forward in that. Because faith without action is dead. If you can become aware of it, you have to move forward to take intentional action to break these patterns. And what better way to start breaking it than on church with a proclamation of faith. So this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you, if you know this function has run rampant in your family and that that sin has destroyed so much, taken so much from you, robbed so much from you and your family, and you are tired of this mess, would you just simply raise your hand? Simply say, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Now let me ask you something else. Put your hands still raised. If, if you are ready to be a cycle breaker, to say it starts with me, I will be the black sheep of my family. I will be the one that lives different. I will be the one that enters Jesus Christ into this situation so everything around me changes. If that's you, I want you to simply stand up and to come to the front and allow me to pray for you. Just simply come right here to the front. You come right here to the front. Are there any more this morning? Just come right here to the front. I just want to pray over you. You recognize the patterns. You say enough is enough, and I want to break those through the power of Jesus Christ. Are there any more this morning? Amen. Friends, here's what I want, to, I want y'all to do. I want you to repeat after me. Lord, I need you. I can't do it myself. I tried and I failed. But I need you and my family to break these patterns, to have a new creation, to bring righteousness, to bring holiness, to bring love, to bring peace, to bring reconciliation, to bring joy, and to bring all you have for me. Lord, we lay it at the altar, and we ask your Holy Spirit will take us from here. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. Amen. Amen. We have one final song, if y'all are up for it. You know, GT and I, we can stay in church all day, but I know some of y'all are getting a little antsy. <laughs> You're like, we got to beat the Baptists to Torchy's Tacos or Lupe Tortilla. <laughs> it's no longer Lubies, amen. It's Torchy's Tacos Live Oak or Lupe Tortilla. And so would you please stand as we sing our final song this morning? Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Sing that again this morning, shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the street, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. One more time, church, sing Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the street. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Because we believe this church, your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name Shadows. 
fire. I just want to speak. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you remain standing and just open up your hands, your arms, your palms up to receive this blessing for you and your family today? We heard that dysfunction is a pattern that continues until we break it. But we are not able to break that kind of thing alone. We need the power of Jesus. Jesus, heal us. Jesus, break the cycles of sin in our lives. Jesus, let 1,000 generations of mercy and healing begin with us. May we be family builders instead of those who tear each other down. May we be peacemakers. May we be Jesus people for a Jesus needy world. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Oh, lost another one. I am free. I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free, I am free. Oh, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free, I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free. I am free, I am free. Hell lost another one. I am free, I am free. You pick me up, you turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name forever free. I'm not the same. I I thank the Master, I thank the Savior, I thank God.